Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Most Thursdays right now, we're doing live streams over at twitch.tv slash socialismS4A. However, it's the end of the year, last week of the year, December 27th, as I'm recording this, and there's going to be no stream this week. However, there are most weeks, so if you want to head over to twitch.tv slash socialismS4A and sign up to follow it, that's generally a good investment. But while I can't do the usual sort of three-hour live stream and respond to the chat that we usually do, which I enjoy doing, I did want to respond to a few comments that had come up and just do a few things that we would have covered in the live stream. So basically in this video, we're just going to look at some comments that came up and I'm going to follow up on the COVID thing that I put up on the community tab. And generally, I think it should be pretty good. So if you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon or buy me a coffee at patreon.com slash socialism for all or buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for a one-time or a recurring donation. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, and they allow me to spend a lot more time on this viewer-supported, non-commercial channel than I would be able to do otherwise. And thanks to the current patrons and Buy Me A Coffee supporters whose names are on the screen. All right, so the first thing we're going to do in today's pseudo live stream, actually being recorded offline, is look at the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, COVID is not over. As you can clearly see on this chart, of the wastewater data from biobot.io slash data. It's B-I-O-B-O-T dot I-O slash D-A-T-A. Basically, in every year of the pandemic so far, this week, the last week of the year, is always the worst. And the peak basically happens on New Year's Eve every year. So I did a little bit of an extra longer post about that. I'm going to read that here in just a second. But while we have the chart up on the screen, you can see the region by region breakdown. The chart on the top is the overall pandemic going all the way back to early 2020. And we can see that the national average of the COVID or SARS coronavirus 2 viral particles showing up in the wastewater is basically at the third highest point in the overall pandemic. Number one, you have the Omicron peak of two years ago. Then we have the two peaks. I'm counting those as one because basically 2022 was an unmitigated shit show when it came to COVID spread. Lots of people got multiple reinfections, which is really bad. Every time you get infected, there's a significant chance of major organ damage and also of contracting long COVID. Even if you're fully vaccinated, which we do recommend, stay up to date on your boosters, but even if you're fully vaccinated, your risk of long COVID does not drop to zero. It's reduced, but not all the way to zero. You're still at risk for long COVID. I have had long COVID basically for 11 months in 2021. I couldn't think straight. I had fatigue and I had apparently immune impairment because I developed some other side issues that normally wouldn't have been a big issue. Like I had a sinus infection. I have sinus issues and allergies. I don't usually get sinus infections per se. And when I do, well, I don't need to go on two rounds of antibiotics to clear it up. In fact, I don't actually remember the last time that I had to go on antibiotics at all. So I believe that this is because the SARS coronavirus 2 attacks and kills T cells, B cells and T cells being like the two major pillars of your immune system. Well, like HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, which is characterized by major immune dysfunction, well, SARS coronavirus 2 also attacks and kills T cells. There's a couple other viruses that can infect T-cells and turn them cancerous. But as far as just straight up murdering T-cells, and we've covered this in previous COVID updates and live streams, it's HIV and SARS coronavirus 2 that actually does that. If you're down on T-cells, it can increase your odds of having just various random common opportunistic infections turn bad. And so we're seeing in China that white lung pneumonia. Allegedly, it's not being done by a novel pathogen. It's just common pathogens that can cause respiratory ailments, but they're taking off on a level never seen before. Well, is that because China joined the rest of the world in letting COVID rip? I think it's entirely possible that that happened and then it caused widespread immune dysfunction and it's causing more common respiratory ailments to take on much more dangerous proportions because people's immune systems, at least temporarily, are unable to cope with them as they normally would be able to do. And we've also seen this white lung pneumonia in other places, in Ohio, in the US, and some European countries. And then beyond that, if you recall in 2022, when there was a major outbreak of RSV, not normally a really dangerous pathogen for most people, but 
we were seeing in hospitals lots of people coming in with serious RSV infections. Why? Was it COVID-related immune suppression, immune dysfunction, because of all of that COVID spread and all of those infections earlier in the year? I think it's likely. Well, what we saw this year, since the winter and you know early spring, is a long lull. Not as deep of a lull as we saw in 2021, but a lull nonetheless. The average for the country was around 200 copies per milliliter of sewage. And that was pretty good. It was much lower risk of catching it. I still wore my mask anyway, but much lower risk in general. However, what happened in the fall? Well, same as 2021. I mean, it's a slightly different shape, but occurred in basically the exact same place as we saw Delta in 2021. Well, we got another wave this year. Then what's been happening since Delta? Well, another wave. And again, the national average right now, third highest point of the pandemic, number one, again, Omicron, number two, basically that period between May and early fall of 2022. And now we are at a higher peak than Delta, than the 2020-2021 winter, and then the early peak back in like March, April 2020. So as I've said before, if COVID wasn't over in the winter of 2020-2021, and if it wasn't over in the fall of 2021, why are we declaring it over now when there is more spread than there was then? All right, so going down to the regional breakdown, you can see that the Northeast is just completely off the charts at 1,500 copies of the virus per milliliter. And again, I recommend going to either Biobot or you can go to the wastewater scan website and get information about your city or county or whatever is closest to you in terms of a wastewater monitoring station. And that is important because, again, the regional breakdown gives us more of a clue as to what's going on. You can even see pretty significant differences between the different regions. But then within the different regions, you've got like a dozen states in each. So, again, that's going to vary, but overall, pretty high spread right now and rising. And those charts have been updated. Usually they just update on Mondays, and that was when I did this post. However, the graphic is actually updated because this week they updated on the 23rd as well. So what did I have to say? COVID is still airborne and COVID still very much isn't over. Northeastern and Midwestern USA SARS-2 virus levels in wastewater are soaring. The Northeast is currently at 1,500 copies per milliliter and about half of that, about 7, 750 copies indicate a strong surge, while the Midwest is at 1,300 copies per milliliter. The Southeastern and Western US are maintaining relatively lower levels between 600 and 700 overall, but both are still climbing, basically on the verge of entering into what I would consider surge territory. So how do you reduce your risk of infection? Well, the SARS-2 virus is airborne, and so basically it can spread like smoke. So what you wanna do is mask up with an N95 or better. Technically an N95 is not a mask, but a respirator, but you get the idea. And even better than going out with a mask, if you can avoid super spreader events and locations entirely, that would be preferable. If you do have to go out, definitely do mask up. But you also want to stay up to date on your boosters. So plan A is wear a mask. Plan A is an N95 we trust, or an N99, or a KN95, or an FFP2 or 3, or a P100. There's a bunch of highly rated masks that will really significantly reduce your risks of infection, while a surgical mask or let alone a cloth mask really isn't going to give you as much coverage. You want something that makes a firm seal around your mouth and nose. So do it for yourself so that you don't catch SARS coronavirus 2 and for others so you don't spread SARS coronavirus 2. Even if you're fully vaccinated, your risk of developing long COVID following an infection is lower, but it is not zero. And multiple reinfections increase your odds of negative health outcomes. Basically, SARS coronavirus 2 can infect any tissue in your body that has ACE2 receptors, which is basically all of your major organs. So it can infect the brain, the heart, the liver, many major organs. So as I said, plan A should always be to prevent an infection from developing. Don't let the virus in your body. By wearing a respirator with a good seal around your mouth and nose, whether that's FFP2, FFP3, KN95, N95, N99, P100, whatever. So also some holiday tips. If somebody starts telling you that COVID's over, you might ask them why. If we didn't consider COVID to be over in 2020 or 2021, which was when the COVID wastewater levels were lower, then why should we consider it over now when the virus is circulating in even higher amounts? Also, somebody starts talking about fewer cases. 
yeah, there are fewer recorded cases because there are fewer cases, period. No, because they're not recording them as much. So fewer cases doesn't mean that much when most of the at-home rapid tests don't get counted in official records. They only do if somebody on their own volition decides to report it. A very rare scenario. Most people wouldn't know where to report those results even if they wanted to. And also the more accurate PCR tests, not the rapid antigen tests that you do at home, but the PCR with the long swab and then they do the test in a lab. Those are now no longer freely available, nor are they given to everyone getting on a plane or attending classes like they used to do. So most of those cases are just not getting caught by any authorities who are actually recording it in that centralized place. Some are like a handful, but really this is just done now. So you really can't go by that case count. Wastewater, much more accurate thing because that doesn't really rely on the reporting. It's just if somebody gets infected, they get the virus in their body, the virus uses their cells to replicate itself, then it comes out in your excretions and then it gets picked up in the wastewater and we can still see that. Also on the subject of people getting accurate tests in large numbers, some people were commenting about the test positivity rate. So a lot of the test positivity rates are like 50% right now. That was what one commenter was saying in their area. So I wanted to just comment on and try to straighten out some of the misconceptions about test positivity. Test positivity only really matters if you have mass scale population testing. If you don't, and the only people who are getting tested are symptomatic people who are very likely to be sick, then your positivity rate is gonna be much higher because you're not testing people who aren't symptomatic. Therefore, a much higher proportion of the tests are gonna be positive. So back in the days when PCRs were not only freely available, but they're also mandatory if you were doing certain activities, then the test positivity rate, they were aiming to keep it under 5% to avoid shutdowns. You know, that was more of a thing because you were just kind of testing everybody. If you're only testing people who appear to be sick, then again, that's no longer really significant. Also, you still can get PCR tests if you don't want to go with the rapid antigen test, rapid test results. You can go and get an over-the-counter PCR test and then send in the results to a lab that will do the PCR test and really kind of definitively tell you whether you have COVID or not. And on a better timeline, arguably, than you can do with the rapid test because the rapid test sensitivity is actually several days after peak symptoms and peak infectiousness. So by the time your rapid test is going to tell you that you are sick, you may already have given it to a lot of people, but the PCR test now you have to pay for, and it's going to be somewhere between $120, $150. For people who have that kind of money, arguably it is worth it, but much more of an expense. All right, finally, fewer deaths also means less when you remember that 1.2 million, roughly, of the most vulnerable people already officially have died from COVID-19. COVID also remains the number three cause of death in 2023 behind heart disease and cancer. And the thing about that is the risk of both heart disease and cancer may be directly increased by COVID. The link to heart disease and heart attacks is very well established. And I gave links to all this stuff below. And the risk of cancer, I believe there are some studies on this. It's not as well established. I mean, I think in general with cancer, it's kind of taboo to really talk about what causes it and how to, you know, do something about it. There's a very narrow pathway of legitimate discussion there. But anyway, it follows if COVID is impairing your T cells and T cells are involved in the kind of day-to-day -day maintenance that your body does, that your immune system does to monitor for cells that have gone cancerous and to kill those cells. Well, then it stands to reason that there may be, if you're impairing your T-cells in that way, an increase in cancer that kind of slips past those sentinels, those guards of the immune system. I would not be surprised to see more studies more firmly establishing that anyway. Also, the risk of a long COVID or post-acute COVID syndrome, PACS-related disability, or other potentially life-shortening organ damage, whether that's brain kidney, lung, whatever. That's a major health risk that could shorten your life, yet that's not gonna be measured by the death count. So if we wanna look at something like that, you can look at life expectancy, which for the US still has not recovered from the drop that it experienced following the start of the pandemic. So four years later, the USA's life expectancy has not gone back up to pre-pandemic levels. Conclusion, COVID is not over. Meanwhile, you got people in the comments saying stuff like this, Bro, it's literally just the sniffles. Take some NyQuil and a chill pill. 
No, that is COVID-19 disinformation. Do the sniffles shrink your brain and age it 10 years as we knew a year and a half ago? Do the sniffles attack and kill T-cells? Do the sniffles increase your odds of a heart attack? No, of course not. And what was this person's response? Quote, I'll bet you're triple vaxxed. Wow, you sound super informed, not ignorant at all. Not some random other conservative dumbass trying to plug an unsuccessful channel by spamming up my comments. Fuck you. All right, so speaking of comments, let's go into a few comments out of the S4A mailbag. Here's the first one. Hey, I have a few questions, and this was posted on the Principles of Communism video. For people who aren't familiar with the audiobook Principles of Communism by Engels, this is basically the Communist Manifesto, but written as a frequently asked questions file. I highly recommend it. And actually, in this video, in the course of responding to this comment and another comment, we're going to read, I don't know, maybe a good third of it. So, hey, I have a few questions. In the course of this revolution, what does number three of the frequently asked questions mean exactly? Sounds bad, but terms of that time period are different. Then there's number six, the complete centralization of banking. I have fears about a lot of government power. Can you point to a resource that could explain to me how we might need to structure a government so that it would be hard for a corrupt government to abuse this new power. I'm a baby socialist, so if these questions seem elementary, it's because they are. Okay, well, first of all, welcome to the channel. Thanks for asking these questions. So something that you have to keep in mind, and that I keep in mind when I try to answer these questions, is that people who don't really know anything about Marxism, coming to trying to understand socialism from a lifetime of being reared by the capitalist system and being full of, in this day and age, neoliberal propaganda, which is pushing very hard an agenda of skepticism of government, defunding public programs, privatizing formerly public resources, and then deregulating all business. Those are basically the cultural assumptions of the time that people have been raised with. Whether you agree with them or not, you have been marinating in them for a while. And so that's something to understand about the baggage that you bring to this, is that that is not really correct. And when we talk about socialism, we're talking about a system that turns all of that on its head. So in the interest of remaining open to the very different concepts presented in Marxism, just kind of keep yourself in check by reminding yourself, you know, pinching yourself and remembering you were raised in a capitalist system by basically, you know, being surrounded by capitalist propaganda and ideology from the day you were born. All right, so keeping that in mind, let's get into principles of communism, several of these relevant sections, and let's see if we can help the commenter. So here it is, Friedrich Engels, 1847, The Principles of Communism. Number one, what is communism? Answer, communism is the doctrine of the conditions of the liberation of the proletariat. Okay. Number two, what is the proletariat? If communism is the doctrine of the conditions of its liberation, what is this thing? Why do we care about its liberation? The proletariat, they answer, is that class in society which lives entirely from the sale of its labor, or labor power, and does not draw profit from any kind of capital, whose wheel and woe, whose life and death, whose sole existence depends on the demand for labor, which again, they live entirely, we live entirely from the sale of our labor. So the demand for our labor is critical. If there's lower demand for our labor, we are screwed. Hence, on the changing state of business or the vagaries of unbridled competition, which is what determines the demand for labor at any particular period. The proletariat, or the class of proletarians, is, in a word, the working class of the 19th century. Three, proletarians then have not always existed, no, there have always been poor and working classes, and the working class have mostly been poor, but there have not always been workers and poor people living under conditions as they are today. In other words, there have not always been proletarians any more than there's always been free, unbridled competition. So this is a major point in here that it's the free, unbridled competition of business which proletarianizes the population. The capitalists rise to power under conditions which are described later in this document, sort of where, when, and how of the capitalists rise. And once they're in power, what's their interest? Well, they need workers because it's workers who multiply their capital and make them richer. And prior to the modern period that we call capitalism, this never existed on such a major scale as the dominant force in society, but it is now. And so proletarians, as this massive class, which 
as is described elsewhere in this document, consists of people who used to be in other classes, but then got ruined, proletarianized, and turned into wage workers. That is a modern phenomenon. However, and this is a very short answer to the question that's emphasizing what this phenomenon is like today. I believe this was later clarified and complicated a bit by explaining that there were a handful of proletarians back in the day. The word itself meaning providers of offspring, meaning the only thing that they could contribute to the empire that they lived in was their bodies and the bodies of their children. But they were never the major force that sort of makes society go that they are today. So I believe Marx and Engels later made the statement, and it sounds like a very Marx statement because Marx loves in his writing to do the juxtapositions and inversions that proletarians used to exist at the expense of society, but in capitalism, society exists at the expense of proletarians. So it's only in capitalism that we get this major mass of proletarians as we see now. So don't confuse any poor or working class with the proletariat of today. It's not the same. Slaves and proletarians are different. Serfs and proletarians are different, as is explained in this document. So the commenter's first question was, what does number three mean? I hope that that's clear. So the second part of the question says, then there's six, the complete centralization of banking. So actually, this is not section number six of the document, but in a later section, section 18, what will be the course of this revolution? Point six on a list of 12 demands, or at least projected demands about what is going to be going on after the socialist revolution, is centralization of money and credit in the hands of the state through a national bank with state capital and the suppression of all private banks and bankers. But coming back to the commenter, I have fears about a lot of government power. Can you point to a resource that could explain to me how we might need to structure a government so it would be hard for a corrupt government to abuse this new power? And I think you're thinking about government in the abstract. As I was talking about, neoliberalism um, is a, the period that we're in now of capitalism, where there's a big push on sort of personal freedom, individual liberty. What this means is they're pushing for increased freedom for capital. That's what it means. And so it's like government power and the corrupt government. There's all these kinds of abstract takes on government. That's not how you need to understand government if you're interested in studying Marxism. And reminder, Marxism is not just an identity. It's a series of analytical tools that you have to study. Just like you can't say, I'm a chemist without studying chemistry, or I'm a biologist without studying biology. You can't just say, I'm a Marxist without studying Marxism. So the Marxist understanding of the state is that it's an outgrowth of class society. Class society being the period in human development for the last 10,000 years or so, marked by inequality stemming from the existence of classes, classes being groups of people with different orientations to the means of production. The means of production are whatever the technology is that's used to produce the goods and services that are meeting human needs, whether that's food, clothing, shelter, the basics, and then more advanced needs, the need for intellectual development, social bonding, entertainment, etc. So in class society, there have been different stages. If you study works about historical materialism, and I want to point out here that we have playlists on the channel, which are recommended reading lists, which will take you through a lot of these basics. If you either click on the playlist tab, or I think the way now that YouTube has reorganized itself more easily, if you go to the home tab and then scroll down to the playlist section, you will see recommended reading lists and party and organization reading syllabi and curricula. Go through those, get the basics. But in historical materialism, it describes how there have been several major periods within class society, which are marked by different classes being in charge of society or being the ruling dominant class in society. And basically, these are driven by class struggle coming out of technology. Or in other words, the material ways in which humans do things in this world to provide for ourselves. So right now, we're in the period of capitalism, which is marked by the capitalists being the ruling class. Therefore, the government is the capitalist government. Every government has a class character. Every political party has a class character. And you have to understand that when you're talking about government power, this and that. So with a capitalist government, run by and for capitalists. Well, what are the class interests of the capitalist? They want to get richer by extracting the surplus value of the proletarian class. Basically, every government policy is oriented around expanding and stabilizing this system for as long as they possibly can. 
And a lot of people realize that this is not a good thing, that the government doesn't work for the whole of society. It works for the ruling class, which is a parasitical exploiting class in capitalism. However, after a socialist revolution, what happens? Well, the socialist revolution, socialism being the revolutionary ideology of the liberation of the proletariat, you have a socialist revolution, the working class, the proletariat becomes the ruling class. This is for the first time in the history of class society that the ruling class is also a majoritarian class. As such, this is the beginning of the end of class society for reasons that actually are explained further on in Principles of Communism. So when you're putting the entire banking system into the hands of this government, it is a government of and for workers, not the bourgeoisie. It is not trying to exploit the workers and so on. It is trying to build socialism, which is a transitional period away from capitalism and toward the free-flowing abundance and liberation of full communism. But that state, the worker state, the proletarian state, is needed in the interim because, as Mao says in one of the last texts that we just read up on the channel on Khrushchev's phony communism, class struggle does continue for generations under socialism. So even after workers take over and drive the capitalists into submission, the capitalists can rise back up again. That's the old capitalists can rise back up again. And then new kinds of a bourgeoisie can emerge using the socialist state machinery that's owned by the whole people. They can start using it in ways that um, put products onto the black market and otherwise enrich individuals. So basically subverting the socialist system for a return to capitalism. So the government, in other words, that we're talking about in socialism is one whose class character is proletarian. In other words, its policies act to further proletarian class interests. That means suppressing the bourgeoisie, and you have to put the money power in the hands of that government. All right, hopefully that is a good intro to you, and I'm happy to field additional questions. All right, so now on to commenter number two. They had some more general questions, and you know, this reminds me in the live streams of a lot of times, like two thirds or three quarters of the way through, some good faith sock dem wanders in and says, oh yeah, I'm a socialist. I live in Germany. Germany is socialist. No, Germany is not socialist. It is social democratic. This is just basically capitalism with some stop gaps to try to prevent some of the excesses of inequality and exploitation from happening, but it still is very much based on that system. And it's not really going to lead to any revolutionary change in and of itself. I like these discussions because these are people approaching communists to try to go the next step or at least exchange ideas. And I think that these are good opportunities for the left. I mean, if, if you consider sock Dems to be on the left, I think that the sock Dems who really know what they're doing, they know that they're there to uphold capitalism permanently. And, you know, they have eyes open about that arguably are not on the left because they're just trying to uphold capitalism. I think some of the more naive ones think that they're socialist and they believe that reformism is a way to creating full socialism. And that is a misunderstanding that I'd like to talk to them about. So it depends on the sock then. But anyway, here's the comment. I've been trying to dig into communism, trying to understand and maybe convert. Let me stop you right there. This is not a religion. It's not a conversion. It is a set of analytical skills you learn. Marxism also can be described as the revolutionary ideology of the proletariat, but this conversion thing, please stop thinking in these terms. What you want to do, I would suggest in place of thinking, you know, converting like you're buying a product, you know, picking a different coat off the rack and trying it on. What you want to do is know what class you are in. What is your class standing? Are you a proletarian? Are you petty bourgeois? Are you big bourgeoisie? And you can determine this by your relationship to the means of production. Do you sell your labor power for wages in order to survive? Do you own a moderate amount of capital and live off of that? Or do you own a huge amount of capital and live off of that? Well, then respectively, you are a proletarian, petty bourgeois, or big bourgeois. Now, once you've identified what your class standing actually is, you want to adopt the ideology that actually reflects the liberation of your class. If you're a capitalist, well, then you want to support one of the imperialist or advanced monopoly capitalist parties. You would want to support the Democrats or the Republicans because they stand for advanced monopoly capital and its aggressive enforcement throughout the world. Also entailed in that is that capitalism is going through major crises right now. And so they're having to fortify their system with enhanced terroristic social control. And so that brings various kinds of fascist parties into the fold. Now, coming off of that, if you're petty bourgeois, you might go for some kind of 
uh, diluted middle class small investor thing like the Libertarian Party, where you think that the small investor class is the backbone of your country and you resent the big bourgeoisie because, you know, it's a club that you're not a member of and they're just out to screw us all. I mean, you also are out to exploit people, but, you know, turning a blind eye to that for a minute, you think that that's your right. And this dovetails nicely, actually, with the fascism that the imperialists put out there because it's all an effort to save their system from what? The third group, proletarians. Proletarians are the exploited class in capitalism. We're the ones that our labor makes everything go. Our surplus value makes the capitalists capitalists, makes them rich. And at this point in the development of capitalism, the capitalists have fulfilled the historical duties and they have taken historical development as far as it can go under capitalism. What does this mean? Well, in dialectical materialism, historical materialist terms, which is something that we do in Marxism, looking at the overall development of class society and technology, we see advances in productive capability that periodically cause a quantum leap or revolution in the way that society is organized around the technology that we use to do the things that we do to produce the goods and services that make life materially possible. When capitalism first came into existence in the 18th century and it started overthrowing feudalism, we as Marxists regard that as historically progressive because it took humanity further and laid the groundwork, got us a step closer to the full freedom that is achievable under communism. The basic process is the capitalists take over, they overthrow the fetters of the feudal economy, feudal political system, feudal social control. They rearrange things to make uh, all of those things more amenable to allowing capitalist production. But then after a while, these former freedom fighters, you know, that rally the whole society around them as we're pushing out of the feudal dark ages, what do they do? They halt that progress because if the progress continued, it would mean that they too would be overthrown. This is because freedom for the whole society means freedom for the proletarians. Well, what's oppressing and exploiting the proletarians? The entire system around the extraction of surplus value enforced by the capitalists. So if this freedom fighting, you know, went, quote, too far from the capitalist perspective, then that would mean their own overthrow. The proletariat becomes liberated, then we're in a completely different place, not in capitalism. So they try to arrest that process at a certain point and basically declare revolutionary historical progress over. And they try to tell you that only incremental progress can now come within the capitalist system, but that any additional revolutions, another class rising to power as the dominant ruling class, like particularly the proletariat, which is the other major class that emerges in capitalism in that historical time period, well, they try to come up with all kinds of things about you know how this is the fall of the empire. I mean, something proletarians actually would like to see, but that it would just be anarchy, chaos, whatever, and that any deviation from capitalism is going downhill, in other words. Well, we don't think so. Once the proletariat becomes strong, numerous, educated, we don't need those parasites extracting our surplus value. We can run the system ourselves. That would be actual democracy and freedom for us, the majority of the population. So you can see all these things have a class character. So if you are a proletarian, you want to adopt an ideology and join a political movement that actually expresses the interests of your class. That would be socialism. And maybe even if you're petty bourgeois, because you're not far off. You have much more in common with a homeless worker than you do with the top 1%, let alone the 1% of the 1%, and the people who actually make the laws and control production and decide wars and all that other stuff. In other words, your future as a petty bourgeois, small capitalist, Odds are you're going to end up back in the proletariat at some point, or at least very close to it. So as far as you converting, or I would recast that as just understanding what your class interests are, and then acting on those, I mean, we can leave it open-ended. Again, as a proletarian, I'll make an appeal to the petty bourgeoisie to see that you're not so different from us. And actually, you as a class can't really do anything on your own, because there's not that many of you, you're maybe 10% of the population or 5%, and you don't have enough money to actually determine anything. So neither in numbers nor in wealth can you do anything on your own. You got to hit your wagon to one of the great decisive classes, either the big bourgeoisie or us. In other words, I can confidently say this because if everyone in society really saw clearly their class interests, the proletariat has the numbers. We would win instantly. 
if class conscious, class aware proletarians did the right organizing, we would win instantly. The main problem, or one of the main problems, and we'll actually get into this a little bit more in the third commenter's question, is that the USA is a country with primarily proletarians in terms of our actual class standing, who have adopted petty bourgeois ideology. So they have an ideology that does not match their actual class standing. Part of this is because the US, as like the leading imperialist country, is able to generate a lot of buy-in in different ways. There's the settler colonial nature of the country, which has been giving away land and also creates an us versus them in terms of the colonial versus the indigenous population. Anyway, there's a lot of ways that they are able effectively to confuse people about where their interests lie. What we're trying to do is untangle that and open people's eyes. So anyway, that's my very long answer to the thing of conversion, which I think is just, this is not, again, a piece of clothing you're trying on. It's your class interest. It's connected to your actual real world material interest. All right. And so this person goes on to say that they will help the cause of it if it is truly what they see as the proper way to govern a country. Well, it's not just a system of politics. Again, it is a question of class struggle in a much longer term time frame of human development. Continuing, I've watched people like Second Thought and the What is Politics channel. I assume he's some type of communist, if not an anarchist, or even some Martin Luther King clips. I really appreciate the work you've done. Okay, so just to clarify on that, I am not really familiar with the What is Politics channel. I did take a look at it in an effort to try to understand and answer this question. They do look like some kind of anarchist, not a Marxist. Marxism and anarchism are really different. Marx and Engels did a lot of criticism of anarchism back in their time. Anarchism is not new to us today. It existed back in Marx and Engels' time. Uh, for a good example of this, check out a piece. We have it on the channel, The Bakuninists at Work. Also, a piece by Marx called On Political Indifferentism. And then beyond that, we have a playlist, Marxists on Anarchism. Like I said, I haven't listened to What is Politics. I actually haven't heard of them before, but they have a thing in one of their videos about how the Bolsheviks, the Revolutionary Party of Russia, were rich kids doing socialism. This is not the kind of analysis that I would really recommend. Also, Martin Luther King Jr. was flatly anti-communist. He gave a speech near the end of his life, the where do we go from here speech. We talked about it in an earlier live stream where he says flat out, I reject Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, etc. I mean, some of us reject Trotsky, but that's for different reasons. He then goes on to describe the need for a social revolution while denying any kind of Marxist base to it. These things are just, I mean, it's just a ridiculous contradiction what he's saying. He also explicitly criticizes Marx for not being idealist enough. He said that it was a major mistake that Marx had rejected Hegel. Absolutely bizarre stuff. But so, yeah, I would not really go into Martin Luther King Jr. too far. As for Second Thought, I understand that Second Thought is a member of the CPUSA. Some of the audience of this channel is also members of CPUSA, the Communist Party of the U.S., which is the same Communist Party, major Communist Party that's been around since, you know, way early, like 100 years ago. And the thing that you have to understand about these legacy Communist Parties is that they're all basically completely, hopelessly revisionist. CPUSA, with regard to the Democratic Party, is very opportunist. Every four years, they run this hashtag vote against fascism campaign where they're like, well, we're not telling you to vote for the Democrats, but we kind of are because we didn't run a candidate. And they go through all these kind of mind games and just insulting their audience. And then they do bullshit cover for it on social media, completely lacking in intellectual integrity and just um, despicable and vile. But anyway, um, there have always been struggles really going back to Lenin's time and even earlier uh, of people coming into the Marxist movement and trying to strip out major theses, major important pillars of Marxist thought, such as the need for a social revolution rather than just gradual reforms. And so the struggle against what we call revisionism, or like anti-Marxism posing as Marxism, this goes back a long way. And it's not just a, quote, purity test. Again, it's like trying to be a biologist, but undercutting major pillars of modern biology, trying to go back to something else that's been proven not to work, for example. If you want a really good example of this, go to Rosa Luxemburg's Reform or Revolution, which is directed against Edward Bernstein. And um, you'll see there how she undercuts the reformist arguments. And anyway, it's just a good example of that. 
But there have been different struggles in different eras. In fact, the most recent series of audiobooks that we did was about Soviet revisionism, modern revisionism in the Khrushchev and on era of the USSR. These things are never really fully processed. And, you know, parties like CPUSA just kind of suck. They're hopelessly mired in revisionism and opportunism, and they're not really viable forces. They're completely irrelevant to the working class movement. In practice, they've been around forever and they have not really gained, you know, any ground in that regard. So I think that that's more where Second Thought is coming from. And I understand also Second Thought is one of the three main hosts of the Deprogram podcast, which I'm told is also hopelessly revisionist on questions of China and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, th the media that's out there today um, has a long way to go still. So continuing, the thing keeping me from converting, again, study Marxism. It's a science. If you agree with it, then keep studying it. If you think you found a flaw, then announce that to the world. And, you know, people, I'm sure, can um, respond to your criticisms. But again, this is not a conversion. Is that I feel I have a huge blind spot in education regarding the subject. Well, OK, so that's exactly what I was saying. You have to study this. Again, go back to the recommended reading lists. If you go to the home tab on the main page of the YouTube channel here, you will see recommended reading lists and party syllabi. Check out some of those. It's going to take you through some of the foundations, whether it's the basic Marxism-Leninism study guide or any of the other ones, and that will walk you through some of these. So best way to overcome your blind spot in education is go listen to the people who are trying to spoon feed you the education as I'm trying to do. Now, even spoon feeding it to you, I mean... There's still ways that you can resist and reject it. So I can lead you to water, can't make you drink, but that is why I'm uploading this stuff, all right? Continuing, unanswered questions and preconceived beliefs regarding human nature. Okay, good, yes. You're going to have to take stock of the various, you know, pieces of pseudoscience when it comes to psychology and sociology and economics that have been fed to you by the bourgeois order in which you grew up and which raised you. So they go on. My current understanding of these concepts is as follows. So economic systems are categorized by how goods and services are distributed and who owns and manages capital. That's not really true, but let's continue. There is a hierarchical structure between government, owner, laborer, and consumer. Also, there can be other stuff like slaves, robots, and priests, but those things aren't really relevant to the present. That's not really accurate either. I don't really know how to directly answer that. I mean, hopefully some of my preceding statements have reoriented you. So anyway, but let's continue. Everyone present is a consumer who takes from a limited pool of resources our environment. Well, let me stop you there. So not everybody in capitalist society has equal uh, right, authority, whatever, to um, take from that pool of resources. And certain people have the right to direct production and make major decisions about what gets produced out of what, how, on what timeline, etc. These are the capitalists, the people who privately own industry and operate it for profit. There's a lot of stuff in postmodernist theory, for example, which has been, I think, rightly termed the cultural logic of late stage capitalism, which emphasizes things like co-creation. The fact is in capitalism, the power to co-create is split along incredibly unequal lines. The capitalists have almost all the power and the rest of us have almost none. This is why we need socialism to break us out of this. Continuing, but there are degrees of ownership, labor, and governing. Okay, so we kind of agree on that point. That's kind of what I was just saying. Governments are an organized body which must establish control over a chunk of a market to a degree and usually have their control maintained by the threat of a military or police force. Yeah, so governments are... A kind of authority. Authority is institutionalized power. Power is the threat of the use of force. So it is a legitimized use of force and institutionalized in an organized way. That That's the authority. And yes, that's a government. So I would say that's more or less correct. Governments are useful in maintaining order and cohesion of these markets. So again, you keep saying markets. That's not the only way to do economic activity, but it is what capitalism does. So these economic systems make the parameters which a market is run by. Communism or socialism seems to be when the government has some degree of control or influence over various markets. No, that is not correct. 
um, you know, probably some um, extremely reactionary neoliberal that's opposed to any kind of regulation whatsoever told you that, but that is not communism. So capitalism is when basically there is private for-profit ownership of industry and capitalists more or less make all the rules, both for industry and society as a whole. Even when there are somewhat democratic elections on various questions, the capitalists always kind of have final veto power by uh, the fact that they legally own the things that people depend on to live. And what does that legal ownership mean? What does that legal claim to ownership entail? It means that they'll turn the courts and the police on you if you contest it. So again, all these things have a class character representing specific class interests over others. Continuing, for example, government-owned hospitals, government-manufactured medicines, subsidized healthcare, and such. Yeah, not really. All of that is happening within an overall capitalist framework in the economy. It's just that certain things get nationalized. So we have a piece up on the channel by Paul Lafargue, Marx's son-in-law, who wrote about socialism and nationalization. Basically, his conclusion is nationalization occurs whenever the ruling class feels that it is in their overall class interests and in the interest of the perpetuation of their class rule to nationalize something. So in the case of capitalists, they might nationalize the post office or at least certain parts of it that are less profitable because the whole capitalist class needs those things and they don't want to you know, have a highly competitive system over that. They just want it to work for the maintenance of their class. Other things like roads, parts of the transportation system, they will nationalize those things because all the capitalists use them and it's just easier for them to do that. Anything else, though, they leave up to the for-profit system. But what would a socialist or proletarian-led society have in terms of interests of that? Well, you don't want, I mean, you want society run according to a rational economic plan. You don't want a lot of enterprises in competition with each other. So in that case, nationalization is in the interest of a different class because a different class runs society. And so it's the interest of that new proletarian ruling class that you have to evaluate, does this make sense to nationalize it or not? All right. The more, inf oh no, the more influence the government has, the more socialist an environment is. <laughs> okay, Richard, I'm not a big fan of Richard Wolff, but his one really solid contribution is the meme, socialism is when the government does stuff and the more stuff it does, the more socialist it is. And if it does a whole lot of stuff, it's communism. That is literally what this commenter wrote. And, you know, I'm laughing uh, with you here, as I'm sure as you learn more about this. I'm not just trying to, like, mock you. It's just funny because this is the kind of understanding people come away with. And it's completely wrong. I just chuckle because I think, you know, I myself at one point didn't understand this as much. It's just funny to see somebody do that uh, meme in the wild. But so mark this on your calendar. This is the day you learn that is not true. All right, continuing, the thing that separates it, socialism, from, quote, totalitarianism, parentheses, a system of government, not an economic system, is that decisions the government makes are based on a large democratic body. So first of all, uh, no, uh, totalitarianism is a general sociological concept that refers to whether there is total control over different aspects of an individual's life. So a great example of a total institution is boot camp. Individuals who are in that institution have basically no control over any of the conditions that they're living in. Everything is decided for them and they are forced to go along with it. So it's basically a bourgeois notion that the idea of workers taking control of society and then using their workers state to enforce their interests, which is not privately owned industry operated for profit, but collectively held industry operated to meet need, the bourgeoisie or the former capitalists or anybody with a capitalistic bourgeois mindset in that system would consider it overly restrictive because it takes away the ability, at least legally, to do openly the one thing that they really want to do, which is live at other people's expense by exploiting them. Does that mean that every aspect of that society, which is restricting bourgeois activity like employment, or, you know, gathering rent from people and things like that, does it mean that you have no freedom at all? No, it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, for most people, you know, the rights that you have in bourgeois society are rights on paper, because they're really only rights that you can act on in practice if you have money. What freedom does a homeless worker have in practice? 
you know, without the capital that's needed to compete in a market in capitalism, you're like a non-entity. So, you know, freedom and justice for all who can afford it is the capitalist way of life. In socialism, you know, you're on the road to the abolition of money. So that's just not the orientation. So the capitalists are used to thinking and people who grow up in a capitalist system are used to looking at economic activity as just competing individuals, just kind of engaging in whatever speculative economic activity they think might be profitable. And the idea that a new order run by workers would come in and direct economic activity according to some kind of central plan that ensures that all of the population's needs are met, that seems like absolute, you know, devilish restriction, just hellish environment, because they want to just do haphazard economic activity, speculative on the, on the idea that it might profit them and so on. But what this results in is a system that breaks down every few years and has to constrain production, has to make sure that there is scarcity, so it creates artificial scarcity, just to prop up a small class of exploiters. So no, in socialist society, there is a different, more collectivist orientation to all of the activity, which in capitalism is much more individualistic, chaotic, anarchic. And so for some people, that looks like, quote, totalitarianism. It doesn't actually mean that like every aspect of your life is, you know, you're just completely under the thumb. That's not the case. And in fact, in socialist society, development is possible, which is evenly spread across the society, giving many poor people, especially opportunities they never would get in capitalism to get educated, to have, you know, consistent food, shelter, clothing, to have all these things as rights, to have like a solid economic rights foundation of their life that you just don't get in capitalism. And freed from that want, it allows the mind to just go, you know, out of survival mode and into more productive things that make for a more dignified life. You can stop thinking like an animal just trying to survive and really develop your human potential. But as far as the governance of socialist society, this is going to be different from country to country. There will be certain things in common like workers' councils, for example. That's what Soviet means in Russian. The Soviet Union was a union of workers' councils. And at different stages in the development of that society, there's going to be different priorities. So if you're directly in the post-revolutionary period, there's probably going to be lots of capitalists still trying to establish themselves. Your country might get invaded. There's going to be a lot of different priorities. So making these kinds of sweeping generalizations is something that can be better replaced by more serious study. All right. Capitalism, continuing the comment, is when a market is not controlled or influenced by government. Okay. Well, by those standards, there would be no laws in capitalism and no country on earth is capitalist or ever has been capitalist. That's just not what it means. At least as much as what we recognize as socialism. Again, that's not socialism either. Um, that's never what Marxism has been about. This is a complete misconception. So in capitalism, there's private ownership of capital and enterprise, meaning that the government doesn't directly participate in it. So first of all, that is not an either or. You can have private ownership of capital and enterprise and also public or government ownership of enterprise. But again, remember, public ownership is in quotes in capitalism because it means that the capitalist government owns things and the capitalist government really doesn't work for the whole public. All right. Government instead tends to play a more focused but equally necessary role in capitalism in protecting people's ownership of capital and other property via a military or police force. Basically true because, yes, the capitalists need force to uphold their private property interests. Otherwise, it would be a system of, quote, anarchy, another government system, or the absence of one due to the government's control over the economy being unenforceable. Well, even anarchists will tell you that that is not the case, that people would still organize into certain groups in order to enforce the will of whatever individuals were in them. Uh, Marxism and anarchism are not the same thing. As discussed before, Marxists have always criticized anarchism. The basic error is that anarchists think that the state is the source of all the oppression in the society. So if you just get rid of the state, anarchists think everything will be fine. However, the state is a product of class society. It has a particular class character. And if you haven't engaged in class struggle 
to abolish classes, then whatever thing that you abolished in your anarchist revolution is just going to appear again later. In other words, they don't get to the root cause of it. Continuing, these two concepts are not strictly separate. Instead, there are gradients and relationships of how their roles interplay. No, not true for reasons explained above. I could be, quote, socialist from controlling how employees' health is treated in the workplace? No. Down to, I mean, the, the, not in the Marxist sense. Marx, in Marxism, socialism is when workers stage a revolution and take over society, dissolving bourgeois institutions and building proletarian ones in their place. And without this key piece of revolution, it's just capitalism. Continuing uh, to down to how enterprises must distribute their revenue amongst their affiliates. Yeah, not, not the case either. I could be capitalist from limiting the amount of capital you can acquire or allowing monopolies to form and annihilating every single competitor. Again, so I think it would be useful here to look at the Marxists.org definition of capitalism to go into this in more detail. So I want to add Marxists.org is a great site for accessing texts. The owners and administrators of that site are Trotskyist. And so anytime there's editorials on the site, it tends to be from a Trotskyist bent. However, taking it with the required grain of salt, you know, this can still be a useful resource. All right, so let's go through the whole thing. Capitalism, and this is from their glossary of concepts. Capitalism is the socioeconomic system where social relations are based on commodities for exchange. In particular, private ownership of the means of production and on the exploitation of wage labor. Wage labor is the labor process in capitalist society. The owners of the means of production, or the bourgeoisie, by the labor power of those who do not own the means of production. This would be the proletariat. And they use it to increase the value of their property, which is capital. In pre-capitalist societies, the labor of the producers was rendered to the ruling class by traditional obligations or sheer force, rather than as a, quote, free or pseudo-free act of purchase and sale, as in capitalist society. Value is increased through the appropriation of surplus value from wage labor, Again, see Marx's wage, price, and profit, or value, price, and profit for a more detailed explanation of the appropriation or extraction of surplus value from wage labor. Continuing, in societies which produce beyond the necessary level of subsistence, there is a social surplus. So this is a big difference between the hunter-gatherer life, which basically marks most animals, including humans, up until class society. In other words, in that state, groups of humans exist in such a way where the existence of the group or all the individual members of the group depends on the contributions of all the members in the group. So it's a much more equal system. There's not really a surplus, so there's nothing to be managed. And while there might be elders that have more knowledge and wisdom, there are not classes as we understand them. Okay, so in societies which produce beyond the necessary level of subsistence, there's a social surplus, i.e., People produce more than they need for immediate reproduction. In capitalism, surplus value is appropriated by the capitalist class by extending the working day beyond necessary labor time. That extra labor is used by the capitalist for profit, used in whatever ways they choose. It's their own property and they can spend it or waste it or whatever. The main classes under capitalism are the proletariat, who are the sellers of labor power, and the bourgeoisie, who are the buyers of labor power. The value of every product is divided between wages and profit, and there is an irreconcilable class struggle over the division of this profit. In other words, the workers want more pay for their labor, and the bourgeoisie want more labor, and they don't want to pay. To the bourgeoisie, paychecks are an expense. To workers, it's all they have. So that's an irreconcilable tug of war or class struggle because these are diametrically opposed interests of two classes regarding the pot of goods and services, the value generated by labor. Capitalism is one of a series of socioeconomic systems, each of which are characterized by quite different class relations. There's tribal society, also referred to as primitive communism, we we're just talking about that, and feudalism. Capitalism is the breakdown of all traditional relationships and the subordination of relations to the cash nexus, which characterizes capitalism. In other words, everything just becomes basically a cash transaction. Everything becomes for sale and not bound by, you know, some kind of sacred bonds, which render it off limits. I mean, you'll have some things that will be made illegal in capitalist society, but for the most part, what used to be 
uh, you know, like the sale of land reserved by the privilege of nobility, well, now you can just buy it. That wasn't the case before. The transcendence of the class antagonisms of capitalism, replacing the domination of the market by planned cooperative labor, leads to socialism and communism. So next page, the historical development of capitalism. Capitalism develops through various stages. Since capital is both a precondition and outcome of capitalism, a period of primitive accumulation marks the beginning of capitalism. This may involve outright theft and plunder, and in particular the creation of a class of people who no longer own any means of production, a proletariat. So that creation of a class of people who don't own anything, well, they may have owned things in the past, so it means ruining them and basically making them propertyless. And then on the other hand, with the ruling class, that period of primitive accumulation, which may involve outright theft and plunder. So, you know, the kind of colonialism that we saw prior to the rise of capitalism itself. Well, that started then. I mean, it's still going on through to this day. By freeing the labor process from traditional forms and expanding labor cooperation through world trade, capitalism initiates a rapid transformation in the labor process and promotes the development of science and technology. And I would add... To a point, capital also constrains science and technology, just as it constrains production and abundance. It needs a certain amount of artificial scarcity to maintain itself, keep prices up, protect profits. And if scientific breakthroughs come along, which are going to endanger that, they do suppress them. So science is real, even under capitalism, but capital does constrain it and limits it. Meanwhile, religion and kinship ties are continuously undermined. Capital is built up in a few countries at the expense of other countries, which are used as sources of cheap labor and raw materials. So remember, everything in capitalism is unequal, and that applies also to the differences between countries. The competition between millions of small-scale producers, which was characteristic of the early days of capitalism, leads to the concentration of capital in the hands of just a few as a more efficient means of production. At a certain point, the beginning of the 20th century, the entire globe had been divided up between a few great powers. Thus begins the final stage in the development of capitalism, imperialism, which is characterized by the domination of the banks, the formation of large multinational corporations, and by war and revolution. So note here, imperialism has been used in a generic sense for a long time to describe military aggression and conquest. However, in this Marxist-Leninist context, it is used to describe the highest stage of capitalism. Lenin wrote a book titled Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. And sometimes Marxists call this capitalist imperialism just to distinguish it from the more generic sense. But this is it, the ossification, the sort of hardening, the final stage of capitalism. It has nowhere to go from this. It can only be replaced by socialism. Whereas capitalism did represent some historical development and progress over feudalism, once that early ascending capitalist stage is over and it hardens into this oppressive imperialism, that's as far as it goes. But it does not end itself. That has to be done by the proletariat and its allies. The free market that had been envisioned by thinkers like Adam Smith was shown impossible by the late 19th and early 20th century, when monopolies dominated nations, causing massive economic collapses in the 1890s, a world production crisis during World War I, and the worldwide depression in the 1930s. Thereafter, national and later international regulation of the capitalist marketplace became necessary. Examples, the SEC, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, etc. So going back to, you know, the age of capitalism you're living through has government. That is there to try to protect capitalism. It is not socialism. While the growth of militarization remains a necessity to expend excess production. So the, one of the big problems in capitalism and what causes the boom and bust cycle is, uh, well, they're, Marx and Engels called them overproduction crises. Basically, more products get made than can be used. And then the capitalists have to throw people out of work and stop production for a while until all the excess capital is consumed then production can resume again. So they've gotten around this problem in part through using the military to just kind of waste it all. For example, the United States, having overspent the Soviet Union in militarization in the last decade of the 20th century, continued to create wars throughout the world. Panama, there's a great movie called The Panama Deception, Iraq, Bosnia, etc., unleashing double and triple the firepower in all of World War II. 
So again, if you can't sell the capital to have it consumed, just blow shit up. This is one of the ways in which capitalism is severely limiting future human progress at this point. Again, relative to feudalism, it was a step forward, but relative to what we could be doing now with the existing material conditions we have, we could be doing a lot more and it's really holding us back. After the incredible expenditure of vast munitions and weapons, over $300 billion worth per year, the subjugated and destroyed nations are then offered contracts and infiltrated by capitalist business for the process of, quote, rebuilding. Again, a rebuilding which would be unnecessary had they not been destroyed just to discharge some of the capital in the imperialist countries. The destruction of capitalism onto a new screen. In capitalist society, the working class continues to grow, and ownership over the means of production continually dwindles into fewer and fewer hands. So when I say that capital tends to consolidate over time, this is what I mean. And this is the rise of imperialism in the first place, is when it really gets concentrated into substantial monopolies and we see new characteristics emerge. But that's the beginning of the end. That is late stage capitalism. That is as far as it can go. At that point, it's just ripe for proletarian revolution. But you got to organize for that. One example of this is the stock market, where the finance banks emphasize that, quote, all workers can own a piece of various companies. In fact, through offering, quote, ownership of these companies to more people, financial oligarchies are able to gain greater control over these companies by diluting the ownership amongst an unorganized group while also extracting capital from this large group for further investment. For example, a bank need only own 10 or 15 percent of a certain company to have an enormous controlling interest over that company, so long as the vast majority of stocks in that company are owned by thousands and tens of thousands of different people, people who do not have the time to attend shareholder meetings and are not united and unorganized on how to exert control over the company. And I would just add, you know, as far as um, voting with your dollars and things like that, this is inherently undemocratic because the idea of democracy is one person, one vote. But if we do that with dollars, well, some people have way more dollars than others. You know, I might have 10, somebody else has 10 billion. Same is true of the stock market, where I think 1% of the stock owners control 75% of the stock. So not remotely democratic. Furthermore, in capitalist society, the value of labor increases while laborers continually receive a smaller portion of the value they create. The selling of labor itself is continually reduced from something that's sold on a monthly or yearly basis to something that is sold day by day and hour by hour, piecemeal, or in short-term contracts. As a result, the income gap grows continually larger. For example, in the United States, from 1988 to 1998, the income for the poorest 20% of the population rose a meager $110 to $12,990. For the richest 20%, it increased by 17,870 to 137,480. Data according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and the Economic Policy Institute checked with U.S. Census data, January 1999. Capitalist ideology attempts to refute Marxism on the basis that the biggest class in capitalist society is the, quote, middle class. This class conception, however, is based purely on economic wealth two cars in the garage, an income of X amount of dollars, etc., and not on that person's actual relation to the means of production. So I talked about that before. Do you own the means of production? Do you live off of a huge amount of capital, a small amount of capital, or do you sell your labor power? The enormous majority of the population in a capitalist society is proletarian. However, through imperialism, some highly specialized proletarians, from executive officers to auto workers, information technology workers to industrial foremen, etc., are paid very well, not by the full value of what they actually produce, but by a higher percentage of that value when compared to unskilled workers and workers in nations subjugated to imperialist exploitation. So in other words, it's people who are paid a greater share of the value that they produce, but who still do not own the means of production, don't really control their work or what they're doing in that way, but somewhat less exploited in terms of the proportion of the value that they're getting back. The capitalists are still robbing from them too, though. Also, I just want to note, a lot of people take issue with the idea of an unskilled worker. This is because even, quote, unskilled work actually takes a lot of skills, and some people, you know, just walking into a job that's considered unskilled would have no idea what to do. They wouldn't know all the tricks. They wouldn't be adapted to it. That actually that work does require skills. It's just not skills that are as highly valued. 
As somebody who has spent decades doing unskilled work, I can attest a lot of it is very difficult and a lot of random people, you know, would not necessarily be a good match for it. I think that the distinction here is you don't need to go to years and years of advanced schooling to do it. In other words, it's not as hard for society to produce people, workers who have the skills required for, you know, less skilled work or whatever you want to call it, compared to somebody that just to get started in a particular field of work, you know, would have to do like lots of advanced schooling. I have many criticisms of the medical field and of MDs in particular, but objectively it's harder for society to produce an MD than it is to produce a custodian. It's not to say the custodian doesn't have, you know, knowledge about what they're doing, just that it does not take the same extent of development of the person doing that work. Continuing. In order for capitalism to function correctly, the petty bourgeois or small capitalist class must be in existence. This is one of the great contradictions in capitalist society because on the one hand, while capitalist production continually pushes small business people out of the market, for example, the owner of the general store, vegetable shop, small grocery store owner, all are wiped out by corporations who establish enormous shopping centers to meet a large variety of consumer needs with products of higher quality to cheaper price. While on the other hand, capitalism cannot survive without a class of people establishing new businesses to fill new consumer needs, and from a very select few of those businesses to recruit new bourgeois, forming large corporations. In the U.S., this is referred to as the, quote, American dream. It's kind of like winning the small business lottery but about as many people actually do succeed at it. The ultimate failure of capitalism is brought about by capitalist production itself. The further technology advances, the more expensive and powerful are the machines needed for production, while at the same time, as a result of technological advances, products produced by more efficient machines become cheaper and cheaper. This has the effect of firstly driving the petty bourgeoisie into extinction, because they can't afford to constantly upgrade their productive forces, while their products continually become cheaper, the reason that they are heavily subsidized by advanced capitalist governments, and further the creation of larger corporations, which must in turn not only shrink internally to maintain efficiency, but must also merge with other companies, forming multinational conglomerates, etc. The further this process continues, production becomes increasingly centralized, and when controlled by the capitalist, the more oppressive and backward production becomes. For example, Microsoft at the end of the 20th century. These technological advances will inevitably lead to either the common destruction of humanity, such as a third world war, or let's add climate change, I think this was written more in the 90s before climate emergency was known, or in socialist revolution, a democratic society where the means of production and distribution will be controlled by the majority. And then finally, for further reading, you can see Marx, Wage, Labor, and Capital, I also recommended uh, Value, Price, and Profit, or Wages, Price, and Profit, and also Capital, Volume 1 and 2, on the process of production, circulation, and of capital, respectively, and Capital, Volume 3, on capitalist production as a whole. We haven't done capital yet. We'll be doing those sometime in the next year. And for a detailed description of the beginning of the later stage of development of capitalism, see Lenin's Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, also coming on the channel later in 2024, although we have many other works by Lenin which go into some aspect of imperialism. Okay, so that's the end of that. That was pretty good. Coming back to the third and final panel of this question, my current stance, I believe a lot of the issues with capitalism can be remedied by a degree of competent government intervention. Uh, no, it cannot. So I'd point you to Rosa Luxemburg's Reform or Revolution. We have it on the channel. Or again, Principles of Communism, which I was going to read um, in greater length here, and this video is already long enough. But go back and check out Principles of Communism by Engels. It will explain a lot. A major point here covered in both works is that capitalism eventually has a final crisis from which it cannot recover. So no, this system cannot go on forever and just, you know, have the capitalist government sort of tinker with regulating itself. That isn't going to work. Eventually, it will break down entirely whether or not the proletariat organizes to create a new system in its place, well, that is an open question and the historical duty of the proletariat. Continuing, but I don't think all of capitalism's issues are issues that must be unique to capitalism. I mean, okay, that could be said of anything, but there also are problems specific to capitalism. 
Again, the boom bust cycle is one of the most basic ones. And I think that more extreme degrees of socialism could be susceptible. So there are not degrees of socialism. You either have a revolution or you don't. All right. So, but again, this person was coming from an incorrect uh, idea of socialism. Could be susceptible to the same ills of capitalism, if not more. The reason for this is that because regardless of who possesses and controls capital, it's inevitably run by humans. Humans are incentive-based creatures. All right, now we're getting really... This is the part I feel like in this comment where we're just getting into complete abstractions. So depending on your version of socialism, it can have issues as any economic system would. This is not a well-explained point. What do you mean by incentive-based creatures? And I also don't really think you understand the kind of system of socialism that we are talking about building. My biggest point of contempt, I think you mean contention, when it comes to socialism, or mainly socialists, is that they don't propose specific plans of how the most optimal socialist societies ought to be run. So, honestly, I'm not trying to be insulting, but, like, this is just your ignorance speaking here. And I just mean that in the least loaded way possible, but because you don't know about the decades of socialist construction which happened in the USSR or in China, etc. So there are countries that have engaged in the process of building socialism, and there are historical lessons learned from that. You just don't know what they are, and so you're saying that no one has any idea how to, you know, concretely build a socialist society, when in fact it has been done. So why don't you just go study that? Personally, they continue, I don't want to jump in and contribute to a movement and rip out the carpet, I guess, on existing society when I don't know quite what direction I'm moving into. I could be running from a pack of dogs off of a cliff. Well, capitalism is about to destroy the capacity of this planet to support life as we know it. If capitalism could solve climate emergency, it would solve climate emergency. That it hasn't means it can't, because it's in its interest to do that. The fact that it cannot solve the climate crisis means that it cannot solve the climate crisis. This isn't just a thing of, oh, they want to run it longer for profit. They can't stop it because it means basically ending the basic kind of activity that goes on in capitalism. Unplanned, competitive market anarchy. If you run things on this basis, you destroy everything eventually. You know, we're finding out that human industrial activity has huge consequences on the natural environment. You know, this planet is not as durable as we thought. The conditions in which life that currently exists evolved in is a fairly narrow range. And if you start really changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere, you can really undercut, you know, you're you're changing the basic range of conditions on this planet. You're making it such that there may be a major ecological collapse. They know this, they've known it for decades, and they can't stop it. How do you know that they can't stop it? Because they haven't stopped it. It just keeps getting worse, and there's no meaningful steps to stopping it. That is just one example. The countless wars are another example. Maybe they haven't hit where you live yet, and so you have a hard time understanding the impact of that, but it's very real for a lot of other people, and it may eventually hit you too. This is a dying social order. It will eventually have a crisis from which it cannot recover, and it will be complete chaos. The capitalists who keep trying to sell you anything else are really just trying to protect their bank accounts, and they're lying to you to do it. So in so many ways, this system does not have a future. We need a new one. The only credible proposal for something else has been Marxism, Marxism-Leninism, and the kinds of socialist societies that have been built using that as a guide. Anyway, the comment ends, I hope that in consuming your content, I can get a better grasp of this concept. I hope you can sell this idea to me. No, so that's not how this works. Again, this comes back around to the conversion, like you're just buying a shirt or a coat off the rack, trying it on to see how it feels. This is the real world. This is politics. This is economics. This is class struggle. This is the proletariat playing a self-conscious part in the development of humanity. It is not a hobby. It is not a fashion. It is a struggle for the future, for dignity, for hope, for rights. That is either real to you or it isn't. 
And this isn't some game where I just suck up to you and try to say the things that you want to hear so that you get on team socialism in some abstract sense. You either get involved in this struggle because you recognize its importance or honestly just stay out of the way. I hope this means something to you and it's the former, but if not, there are plenty of streamers who can provide you with, you know, infotainment that you can just listen to endlessly without any real world organizing activity and, you know, treat it as an abstraction. I'm just not one of those people. All right, third and final question for this video before we wrap it up. This one is about third worldism. So I'll just read the comment. What is your opinion on third worldism? The response I am looking for is specifically to the claim that the working class in the first world, Western Europe, North America, etc., will not do violent revolution as it is not in their material interests to do so, which has been the trend throughout history. From this it follows that the communist organizations should dedicate their resources to the proletariat who are fighting in the third world. The material conditions of the poor in the third world are much worse than the poor in the first world, which is why they have a much higher revolutionary potential. If the revolutions in the third world are successful, they will cut off the spoils of imperialism that the first world extracts from them, causing the economic conditions of the first world to drop significantly, which will create the revolutionary potential needed for revolution. Okay, short answer, not really I don't agree with this. That's not to say there's no truth to it. But I think that a lot of people get wrapped up in somewhat abstract arguments about this topic rather than doing real-world organizing work and therefore just have no claim to be weighing in on this. In other words, Marxist organizing is always about organizing the workers to gain as much power as possible and fighting the capitalists as much as possible. Then, when there is a revolutionary moment, seizing it, taking power. If that doesn't work, then trying again. Because that contradiction between labor and capital is only going away with the death of capitalism, which isn't going to happen on its own. So that is always the question. So is it true that national liberation movements, which are successful and which also are guided by proletarian interests, have been able to cut off some of the external resources of imperialist countries and given them less room to expand? Yes, I think that that is true. Do I think that it's the decisive question that determines the actions of the proletariat of England or France or the U.S. Not really. I mean, it plays a part. But so do decades of revisionist and opportunist leadership, the bourgeois ideas infiltrating the communist and workers' movements, the sheer brutality and force of the U.S. government and police state, the rendering as illegal of basically any effective industrial action or organized labor activity by things like the Taft-Hartley Act, there's so many factors that have penned in the U.S. proletariat and that have led to some people in the U.S. proletariat just trying to be content with the options in front of them and deciding not at the current point, and you know that's been the case for some time, of not trying to confront the system. In the past, there was also the westward expansion where the U.S. ruling class was able to pacify a lot of the population by giving away free land at the expense of the indigenous population, which was driven westward and onto some of the worst pieces of land that there are. So I think that there are a number of factors, and it's somewhat simplistic to just reduce it to this. Also, I want to point out that uh, revolutionary potential, so as the commenter says, the material conditions of the poor in the third world are much worse than the poor in the first world, which is why they have a much higher revolutionary potential. So um, I think by revolutionary potential, this commenter means willingness to do revolution. I want to point out there's another meaning of revolutionary potential, which refers to, well, in this case, the proletariat has revolutionary potential because of their proximity to the means of production. We are the class that actually does the work that makes things go, and if we withhold that labor, things stop working. And that, of course, can be a major overture, and I was talking again about how most of that is illegal. So... Was the U.S. working class in the 40s ready and the 50s ready to start going into purely illegal union action just because it was more effective? No, they weren't. Also, what was the revolutionary, you know, communist leadership at that time? The CPUSA, opportunist to the gills, trying to liquidate itself at that point. So there's that. But also in terms of the proximity to the means of production, a lot of things have been outsourced out of countries like the U.K., France, and the U.S. So this is another place where a lot of the manufacturing is no longer something U.S. workers could stop if we wanted to. 
I find that a lot of people are engaging in a kind of essentialist argument that they find satisfying of like, I hate the U.S. and I hate the people in it because they haven't stopped the U.S. And I think that that is just not, I'm not sure that the people in the U.S. had as much opportunity to do this as you would think. Most of the time, when something actually revolutionary gets started in the U.S., it gets wiped out. That's not a question of revolutionary initiative or anything like that. It's that there's a giant police state with some of the best resources on the planet. So that said, a lot of times we have seen revolution come from the periphery, where empire is weakest. Because, as I said before, the goal here is we're looking for building proletarian strength and then keeping our eyes out for a revolutionary moment. So have these advanced core monopoly capitalist imperialist countries had a revolutionary moment? If so, when and what happened? I think that that would be a better line of analysis. So along those lines, let's take a moment to remember that the first proletarian revolution actually did happen in a Western European country. It was the Paris Commune. It was relatively short in duration, and it wasn't able to spread to the entire country, let alone internationally. But it was the first proletarian revolution, and it was in a Western European country. So why weren't there more of these, as Marx and Engels had hoped and maybe even expected? Well, I like to point to this text, which is the address of the Central Committee to the Communist League from 1850. It's the source of the under no pretext quote by Marx about guns. And it basically speaks directly to what Marx at that time thought a proletarian revolution would look like. And one of the places, what this has to do with, is the 1848 revolutions, which were bourgeois revolutions. And this was Marx's advice to the proletariat, like, what should the proletariat do when the bourgeoisie is just setting itself up? Well, he recognized that this was a time when they were at their weakest. And so if you can hit them when they're at their weakest, you should. And we've seen this in the cases of like World War I and World War II. That was a time when the imperialists were very weak. In the case of the United States, the U.S. was untouched. They came out stronger than ever. Not exactly a revolutionary moment. And then in the case of like the U.K. and France, you had the Popular Front policy, which was sensibly directed toward the preservation of the USSR and the alliance of the communists with non-communist elements that supposedly were anti-fascist. But this kind of took the emphasis off of revolution in what otherwise might have been more of a revolutionary opportunity in the aftermath of World War II in those countries. Instead, we got half a revolution in Germany, and that was it as far as the more advanced capitalist countries. Now, had there been a World War III, maybe another 20 or 30 years later, who knows what could have happened, but it didn't happen. And instead, the USSR ended up going down the path of modern revisionism, China started restoring capitalism in the late 70s, and so on. So not a great opportunity in that set. But anyway, going into this 1850 text, here's what Marx says about you know, what the proletarian should do when the bourgeoisie is weak. So this is following a bourgeois revolution. Two, to be able forcefully and threateningly to oppose this party, the new bourgeois Democrats, whose betrayal of the workers will begin with the very first hour of victory. In other words, the bourgeoisie sets itself up as this freedom force, but as soon as they establish capitalism, it's for the purpose of exploiting the workers. The workers must be armed and organized. The whole proletariat must be armed at once with muskets, rifles, cannon, and ammunition, and the revival of the old-style citizens' militia directed against the workers must be opposed. Where the formation of this militia cannot be prevented, the workers must try to organize themselves independently as a proletarian guard, with elected leaders and with their own elected general staff. They must try to place themselves not under the orders of the new bourgeois state authority, but of the revolutionary local councils, or you might say Soviets, set up by the workers. Where the workers are employed by the state, they must arm and organize themselves into special corps with elected leaders, or as a part of the proletarian guard. Under no pretext should arms and ammunition be surrendered. Any attempt to disarm the workers must be frustrated by force if necessary. The destruction of the bourgeois democrats' influence over the workers and the enforcement of conditions which will compromise the rule of bourgeois democracy, which is for the moment inevitable, and make it as difficult as possible. These are the main points which the proletariat, and therefore the Communist League, must keep in mind, 
during and after the approaching uprising. So basically, form workers' councils, form a proletarian guard, and try to sabotage the new bourgeois system as much as you can. So why have we seen revolution happening more along the periphery? So they were saying this in 1850. Had this ideology really proliferated at that time, had it really penetrated the minds of the working class to do this kind of revolutionary strategizing and so on? Not necessarily, but later on, it did get more extensive. And because the development of capitalism in Russia was much delayed, even compared to Germany, to the 1905-1917 period, well, that gave half a century for this thought to be developed and for the Russian communists to actually implement it when their bourgeoisie overthrew the last remnants of czarism. Did the workers in the Western European countries and in the U.S. have a similar situation? Not really. So this does explain, you know, countries that have not fully had a bourgeois revolution or only a partial one. Why do we see more successful communist activity there? Well, it's precisely because the bourgeoisie is not as strong yet. Because otherwise, what do you have to do? You do have to wait for the bourgeoisie to get weaker. And so, as the commenter pointed out, and, you know, as is part of this kind of running um, train of thought, is that you can cut off some resources from the core imperialist countries by having more revolutions elsewhere. Well, given that those revolutions aren't really happening either so much, I don't know how this is truly a viable alternative to just focusing on organizing within these countries right now. That's not to preclude any organization from giving mutual aid to other groups internationally, not at all. But adopting this ideology where you just write off sections of the world. Again, nowhere in the world is the kind of hotbed that, you know, we would expect had what was going on in the mid 20th century continued consistently. It didn't. And especially with the destruction of even the revisionist USSR in the early 90s, 30 years ago, um, there was a real drop off even in the activity that was going on then, such as it was. Anyway, there's a lot more that can be said about this. I think, again, there's some truth to the idea, but do I think it's the decisive thing? Not really. Yes, there is a lot to be said for curtailing the sort of seemingly endless expansion of the system. That's one of the things that keeps people falsely thinking that capitalism has a future. And all these factors are somewhat intertwined and do lead back to each other when you analyze them. But I do think that this overlooks a lot of other obstacles to sort of practical working class advancement within these countries. I mean, that is exclusively looking at this. I think you're overlooking other things. So let me end on this. Marx and Engels thought that the proletarian revolutions would start in the most advanced capitalist countries. However, they arguably underestimated how strong these governments would be by the time that the proletariat had become class conscious enough and had developed enough revolutionary ideology to really see clearly that their task was the next primary one in human progress and historical development. And by the time that there was more of a communist movement, conditions were such that any old moment for challenging the bourgeois order wouldn't do. Is this purely because, you know, people like bananas and coffee? I mean, I'm simplifying there. It's cheap products across a number of domains. I think that Arguably, it has more to do with a lack of revolutionary moment, sort of windows of opportunity. The last major war on the continent of Europe was, you know, 1945. We're talking about 80 years ago almost. Whereas in the US, it wasn't communist revolution, but just a few years ago in 2020, when they were paying people to stay home and not work, what did people do? Immediately started staging mass protests. Turns out actually people are hugely unhappy about quite a number of social issues, but they're overworked to the point that they can no longer like think straight. So it takes arguably a major social disruption for people to kind of step back from the workaday trance and be like, hey, we got to change stuff. And the COVID-19 pandemic, the beginning of it, when they're actually doing uh, serious public health interventions about it. That was one such opportunity, and it happened immediately. And that was in the context of barely any labor movement, which we have seen an uptick in at this point. I think that the imperialist countries got really good at maintaining business as usual, avoiding interruptions. Now we are on the brink of probably another 2008-style crisis. And of course, 2008 
in the U.S. It led to the growth of fascist bodies like the Tea Party, sort of astroturf, fake populist thing in the uh, Republican Party. But also it did lead to the reemergence of the left. It's one of the reasons that this channel is here. And I know why a lot of the audience started thinking about actual socialist thought and, you know, why did we pick up the supposedly dead ideology? Oh, it's because the struggle isn't actually dead. So as the system becomes more disrupted and maybe there are even major wars, which would be, you know, not something the proletariat wants, but it would be a disruption of business as usual. It'd be really hard to sell people on, hey, this is the best system. Just keep working for us. People are going to be like, you're asking me to go, you know, kill people and possibly die. And for what? So the economy can break down in a massive way and I can lose my house again in another eight years. So, I mean, there's so many factors here, but the relative stability of the system in the post-war period, which may be coming to an end, more competition, more inter-imperialist rivalry, maybe a war, definitely another major kind of crash coming up soon. There may be, you know, the kind of conditions coming up in the not too distant future that do get people more radicalized, more active. I think we are, as I said, already seeing that this channel is a product of some of that. Now, will recreating a socialist camp and, uh, you know, cutting off resources, would that help? Yes. Like I said, that's not really happening. Where that's happening, it's being done along more capitalist lines. So that's just not as um, convincing to me. It doesn't really call to me. Anyway, where I was trying to go with all this is Marx and Engels thought that the initial revolutions would come from within the imperial core. However, those governments proved to be relatively stable and the few opportunities that there were, like World War I, World War II, we did see some revolutions, but it was where empire was a little weaker, where capital wasn't set up as strongly yet. And there were revolutions and those were built. Unfortunately, you know, mistakes were made, modern revisionism, things reverted back. Now we're kind of starting it over again and start it over we must. But the point here is that the entire system is in a completely different stage of development. That is, imperialism, I mean, wasn't a thing in Marx and Engels' time that got established a bit later. Now imperialism is very well advanced and it's spread all over the world to a degree that even at the time of the First World War wasn't the case. More people around the world have become proletarianized, you know, the peasantry is smaller and so on. So the class composition of the world keeps changing. What I'm trying to say is maybe Marx and Engels weren't wrong. Maybe the lasting revolutions really will happen within the core of the imperialist uh, world. And maybe relatively right after the other, as they predicted in Principles of Communism. But maybe we just haven't gotten to the point yet where capitalism is weak enough and people's patience run out sufficiently with it for the kind of revolutionary moment to appear that the proletariat can walk through and create this new world. I hope it comes soon, and I hope that the proletariat is successful, because if not, there's a lot of really disastrous consequences. But I don't know, the, the third worldism thing, um, like I said, it's not that there's no truth to it, but it just goes down this side road, and I always just think of hand-wringing when I see this. There is a sort of flavor of despair to it. I don't know. It just doesn't add up to me. So those are some of my thoughts. Anyway, this video is long enough. I'm going to close by thanking the patrons again. And I want to say that there's just a few days left in 2023. We just recently did the Sino-Soviet split playlist. This also deals with modern revisionism. And I highly encourage you to check out that playlist if you haven't already. And the capstone of all of that that we've been leading up to is a collection of writings by Enver Hoxha about Palestine. Palestine belongs to the Palestinians. I'm going to be trying to post that by the end of the year. If not, it'll be probably the first thing posted in 2024. Um, there's another companion piece, The Marxist-Leninist Movement and the World Crisis of Capitalism, which also mentions Palestine. It is shorter. I would like to do that one after the longer one because it just date-wise kind of fits more towards the end. I don't know, I might post it first just for the sake of time, but that is what is coming up next is those two videos. And then I also am sitting on two streams that we recorded last week and the week prior. I just have to edit those and post them. So that's what's coming up from the channel. Again, if you'd like to support, patreon.com slash socialism for all or buymeacoffee.com slash socialism for all. We've been getting great support. I'm able to think about this channel every day. 
and just keep it moving forward. We just crossed 19,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel. We've got our fourth anniversary coming up on the YouTube channel in February, probably crossing 20,000 around that time. Exciting stuff. Happy to see it grow. Happy to see so many people coming here and getting interested in learning socialism. And I try to give it straight. You know, we don't want to give the impression that this is just a hobby, just a fad, just something that you sort of, uh, you know, root on like team sports. This is a very real thing going on in the world around you, deciding the major conditions of your life. Are you going to stand up for yourself or not? And of course, the way that you effectively stand up for yourself is by standing up for the class to which you as an individual belong. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.